We now take a look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, 38 through 44 verses, um, page 825 in your pew Bibles. Listen now for the word of God. As he taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. These two readings for today from the epistle and the gospel are telling us something about God's amazing love for us. How generous God has been, how gracious God has been, will be, and will continue to be for our sake, for those who believe. I want you to hear that. God is a generous God. God gives us so much. We're blessed. Um, It's all about perspective, I suppose, but really it's about realizing just what God continues to do every day for us. Will we say thank you? Will we praise God's holy name? These passages remind us that God can take what seems to be absolutely nothing and turn them into everything, something. The Hebrews chapter 9 passage tells us that Christ dealt with sin once and for all. And will soon return to greet those who are eagerly waiting for his coming. And in heaven's eyes, those who claim this gospel for themselves, well, their lives will be plentiful. Not just materially, but just spiritually. The spiritual blessings that come from our faith may not guarantee wealth, numerically, with money, but the joy that comes from knowing we've been set free, that we are in the hollow of God's hand, that God always has our back. We're reminded of the Apostle Paul's words to the Corinthians. Listen to this. I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Rich with cash? Rich with spiritual blessings that you wouldn't believe even if you were told. So if we are ever generous in any way, If we've given something back to God, if we've given away our love, our forgiveness, our joy, our treasures, it's because of all that Christ is doing and will do for us. We love because God first loved us. Now the gospel that I'm talking about is juxtaposed with the wisdom of the world. We live in a consumer-driven society where bumper sticker wisdom tells us she who dies with the most toys wins. You've seen that sticker. However, the empty promises of rampant consumerism often leave us with this 
feeling of, wait a minute, there's got to be more to life than just accumulating more stuff. There's, there's got to there's be more to the Christian life than, than, than having more things in the house. The toys. There's an old saying, enough is as good as a feast, and having just enough can be as good as having much of something. But when is enough ever enough? How much QVC shopping can we do? How much Amazon Prime shopping can we do? How many rolls of toilet paper do we really need during a global pandemic? I was at a store, I'm not sure if it was Costco, it might have been, and I was in that aisle where all, there's all the paper products, and this lady comes barreling past me, oh, thank goodness, there's three left and I got one. And it was about the toilet paper. And I said, wow, that, that, that's very exciting for you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Oh, this is great news. This is great news. In today's gospel, there's this parade of wealthy donors going into the temple treasury. They're placing their gifts there. And try to visualize this. People in a processional walking in. And Mark points out the sheer size of their gifts. He's very specific And some poor people are giving very little. In fact, the widow drops in two tiny coins, a pittance even for the poor. And as we read this story, we wonder, well, who are we to judge a person's heart? Who are are we to question their circumstances, their motives, their values um, of anyone who's going to give or not give to God? Only God can see into the human heart, right? Only God knows what's actually going on inside of us at any given time. To quote Shakespeare's Hamlet, there's the rub. The rub is Jesus is watching all of this transpire and he notices a real problem. He notices that the wealthy givers are skimming off the top of their deep and overflowing pockets. He also saw them giving in order to to appear generous, to look good, to look charitable, whereas in fact they might never miss the amount they contribute to the temple treasury. This wasn't really impacting them in any way, shape, or form. So in other words, what Jesus is watching here is duplicity on display. They're not being honest with God. They're not being honest with themselves. And let's not forget what he said just prior to this. And he taught saying, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes, be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, have the best seats in the synagogue. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, they say long prayers. They will receive greater condemnation. So with these words ringing in his listeners' ears that these hypocrites are charging too much for helping the poor, uh, that they only serve for money, that they only pray to impress, he moved to watch people paying in their gifts, placing money in one of the 13 trumpet-shaped chests in the temple treasury. Some of the gifts were impressive, but compared with the poor widow's gift, they were outmatched because hers was all that she had. She had given her whole self to God. And one of my last trips to Israel, Palestine, I was able to buy these coins, but they were known as lepta, or what others have called mites. And two of them together would have paid a farm worker's wage for approximately uh, 10 minutes. And so what's problematic is the fact that the widow, who according to Jesus is already oppressed by society and the religious leaders of the day, gives all she has to an institution that will one day no longer exist. It will be utterly destroyed. This is what we hear in the next chapter, Mark 13, Jesus declares of the temple, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. There it is. The entire religious 
apparatus that has become corrupt will one day be no more. The privileged running it had forgotten all about their role to protect the widows and the orphans, the poor, the vulnerable of the earth. Instead, what they were doing is they, they were really living off of them. This was so corrupt. And Jesus knew it. So I think what this passage is, is, is telling us is something about the coming promise that the days are numbered for religious organizations that exist only for their own well-being. When the Son of Man comes, these types of religious re- regimes, like the temple in Jerusalem, will be completely ruined. Gone. Forever. In other words, the promise of Jesus is that on that day, vulnerable persons will be set free from the oppression of bad religion. But the story also perplexes us because it confronts our innermost insecurities about giving, especially giving to the church. Is our church worthy of our gifts? How much should we give? Um, Are we giving enough? Surely Jesus would understand um, today's circumstances. We've got tuition bills to pay. We've got mortgages. We've got medical bills and everything else that comes to us as a past due invoice. What does Jesus expect us to give to the church? What should we give? When we hear the approval of the widow who out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on, we can only really postulate that this is exactly what his words mean. Give everything. Don't hold anything back. That's it. End of conversation. Give. We can't help but remember just a few weeks ago we were talking about the rich young ruler who couldn't conceive of this challenge of giving everything away. Remember, Jesus said, go sell what you own, give the money to the poor. And he went away grieving because he had so much. And he wasn't sure he could part ways with all that he had accumulated to follow Jesus and to receive this new life that he had promised him. So I've been thinking about this. I knew this moment would come where we could bring our gifts up, and it's just so special, and it's a wonderful tradition. I've been thinking about giving. What, what, do, what do we do with this? What are we to give to the church? And I was thinking about how scholars and theologians have cussed and discussed this subject from the very beginning. And I'm thinking more recently of C.S. Lewis, who wrote <laughs> that Christian charity is neither Christian nor charity unless our giving cramps our style and causes us to sacrifice some needs as well as some luxuries. And that sort of giving, C.S. Lewis says, was really the beginning point. That's where you start. And he says, the question of how to be even more faithful with our time, talents, and treasure is always before us because we long to be honest disciples of Jesus and ones who are growing in his love and generosity. What do you give to the church? What should you give? Should you feel good about it? Should it hurt? And when you give, should you feel miserable? Or should you experience abundant joy? Author Kathy Amlung writes this. She says that wealth in its many forms is intimately linked with our self-identity and self-worth. Our wealth may not be in coins and stock options, but most of us have other kinds of wealth, a pleasing personality, a respect and friendship of our peers, perhaps some genuine authority at work, various skills, talents, gifts, leisure time, the benefits of a reasonably just, orderly, and free society. We use them, we enjoy them, she says. We have them at our disposal. They're valuable to us. They're the coin of the realm of our social interactions and our self-image. And without them, we feel diminished, threatened, 
even dehumanized. And then she adds this. Let's face it. We're going to fight like mad if someone try to take any of these things from us. Giving them up willingly is almost incomprehensible. It's an act of foolishness. It's an act of humiliation. What could the church or anything else provide to compensate for their loss? Well, back to Shakespeare. There's the rub. This is the last scene in Jesus' public ministry. And his pointing out the widow is saying so much because you have to connect the gospel now to the, the Hebrews reading. Think about it. Jesus himself is on his way to giving the whole of his life for something that is corrupt and condemned. All of humanity, the whole world, and the author of Hebrews says this, Christ offered once to bear the sins of many. So there's two tiny coins and a woman. And by the grace of God, she was willing to entrust her entire being to God's keeping. Maybe this is what we're called to be. Tiny instruments of God's grace that reflect a divine giving with abandon that helps free the oppressed and the marginalized and the downtrodden where our nothing is turned into something or even more by God's amazing love into everything. What will you give? Will it hurt? Or will it bring you joy? Let's pray. Our gracious God, we give you thanks for these two incredible readings. One that reminds us of all that you have done for us through the person of Jesus Christ. That our salvation has come at a cost, his death and resurrection. But even more than that, a passage that challenges us to reconsider what we really value and how we give. Help us this day to remember that everything we have is your gift to us. And if we're going to be generous, it's only because of your grace So help us to live this gospel and may our lives and our gifts this day and going forward be to the honor and praise of your most glorious name. For we pray this through Jesus our Lord and all God's people say, amen.